Hello, everybody, and welcome to Neuroblastoma Parent uh, Global Symposium of 2023. My name is Alan Pearson, and I'm a parent advocate from Childhood Cancer Ireland, and I'm also an executive director of technical operations for Endo Pharmaceuticals. Um, today, we're going to hear the landscape overview, and I'll be moderating this session. Um, this session will be delivered by uh, Dr. Susan Cohen, who is the Director of Clinical Sciences and Professor for Pediatrics at the University of Chicago uh, Medicine in the United States, followed by Dr. Lucas Moreno, uh, the Pediatric Oncologist, Division Head, Pediatric Oncology and Hematology at Val de Braun Hospital in Spain. That will be followed by Dr. Az, uh, Araz Marachalian, who is the Medical Director of Neuroblastoma MIBG Program at the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles in the USA. And we'll finish up with Professor Juliet Gray. Professor Gray is the Associate Professor and Consultant in Pediatric Oncology at the University Hospital Southampton, Southampton in the United Kingdom. Before I hand you over to our first speaker, I'd like to draw your attention to the chat function on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, you can submit your questions here. There's an option to do so anonymously if you would choose. Questions will be addressed after all presentations have been concluded. So with that, it's over to you, Dr. Cohen, to present an introduction to neuroblastoma. Well, thank you so much. And I'm just delighted to be here. And it's my pleasure to present um, an introduction to neuroblastoma. Um, I'm going to overview a little bit about neuroblastoma risk classification and treatment approaches. I'm going to describe changes over time and treatment strategies and survival for children with high risk neuroblastoma. And lastly, I will highlight um, some of the information that we have about uh, high risk therapy related uh, late events. So neuroblastoma, as many of you I'm sure are aware, is a, a common malignancy in infants um, and young children. It originates in neural crest tissues, typically along the spinal canal and the sympathetic ganglia or within the adrenal medulla, which is an organ that sits on top of the kidney. It's a, it has a broad spectrum of presenting signs and symptoms and the clinical behavior and response is also uh, quite diverse. Age of diagnosis, stage, histology, and tumor-specific genetic markers are prognostic of survival. And tailored is, uh, treatment is tailored according to uh, risk of relapse, which is based on a combination of these prognostic markers. So in the, uh, in the children's oncology group up until very recently, um, this was the risk classification that we used to stratify patients. Uh, according to their INSS stage, their age of diagnosis, their MCN status, tumor cell ploidy histology, as well as a couple of other clinical features. And patients were then assigned to either low, intermediate, or high-risk uh, neuroblastoma group. And then subsequently, um, treatment varied. And so patients who were classified as low-risk received much different therapy um, because they had much less chance of relapsing, whereas those patients who were classified as high risk had relatively um, aggressive tumors and, and the treatment for those patients was uh, multi-modality intensive therapy. Now in Europe, uh, the risk criteria differed from COG. Um, here you can see they, instead of using INSS stage, uh, terms like unresectable localized or disseminated disease were used uh, for low risk disease as well as for intermediate risk disease. Um, high risk was defined as greater than 12 months with INSS stage four, um, as well as patients who had NMIG amplification who had stages two or three tumors. But because of these uh, differences in criteria, it was not possible to directly compare risk-based clinical trials conducted in Europe and North America. And so uh, in, way back now in 2005, a long time ago already, uh, Andy Pearson from the UK and I uh, led a international neuroblastoma risk group task force uh, with the goal of developing a common language to establish a uniform risk classification system that could be used across the globe so that we would be able to compare 
um, our clinical trials and hopefully uh, accelerate progress in the treatment of patients with neuroblastoma. And the way we developed this risk classification system was we uh, collected and analyzed data on over 8,800 unique patients that were diagnosed between 1990 and 2002, so already a very long time ago. And these patients were treated on COG studies, uh, CYPIN clinical trials, G German clinical trials, as well as Japanese clinical trials. And after we performed this analysis, we identified seven of the most highly prognostic and clinically re relevant factors. And we also, this is very important, developed a new staging uh, system, which is called the INRG staging system, which is based on imaging rather than surgical resection, which is what the INSS staging system is based on. Um, for this particular risk classification because we wanted this to be a pre-treatment risk classification system and obviously surgery is part of treatment. Um, and I have to tell you that the surgeons that were on this uh, task force felt very strongly that we needed an image-based uh, staging system. Uh, similar to uh, Siapin and COG, we did use age as a criteria. We also use histologic category uh, and um, the grade of tumor differentiation. So this is part of the tumor histology was integrated into this classification system and mixed status was integrated. And we also found in our analysis that um, uh, losses of chromosome 11Q uh, were associated with prognosis as well as ploidy. And as you can see, using these different criteria, we were able to then classify patients as either very low, low, intermediate, or, um, or high risk. And this was meant to then uh, be the risk classification system for then the various cooperative groups around the world to decide how they wanted to treat patients who are classified, for example, as very low risk, low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk. Certainly, we were not dictating treatment. We were really trying to just put them into the same uh, risk classification so that the definitions would be the same. Um, in 2009, this risk classif classifier was published and it was uh, adopted by Siapin. So the Europeans very readily adopted this risk classification, largely because the staging system was frankly very similar to what they were using in their previous trials because um, the uh, image uh, classification was also what um, Siapin had used in the past in terms of deciding whether or not a tumor was resectable. Um, in children's oncology group, we used that same 2006 risk classification system until very recently when finally uh, uh, the risk classification was changed. And this was largely because we had a number of ongoing clinical trials that were already based on the 2006 COG risk classification system. But subsequently, as we've developed new clinical trials, we have now integrated the INRG um, staging system into our new risk classifier. And we've also integrated many of the same uh, markers as, uh, as were included in the INRG classification. And so now the, um, the groups in Europe and uh, the Children's Oncology Group risk classification system are very similar. So I just wanna talk a little bit about the challenge of um, high-risk neuroblastoma and some of the lessons that have been learned uh, during the past three decades. Um, one of the first lessons that was learned, and I'm gonna be initially presenting COG studies, and I will mention some Siapin studies um, after I kind of walk you through our history of COG trials. But in the 90s, there was a randomized study that was done by this uh, children's cancer group in which patients were randomized to either receive myeloblative therapy and a bone marrow transplant following induction chemotherapy or just continuation of intensive chemotherapy. And what was shown is that more was better. Um, the, so patients were treated with uh, myeloblative therapy with a stem cell. This, in this particular study, bone marrow stem cells uh, were infused rescue, um, had a significantly better um, event-free survival. Um, th this bone marrow was purged and it was a very complicated procedure. Um, and certainly nobody was very happy with the, um, 
uh, survival that we saw, the event-free survival we saw, this is certainly way, way, way too low, but we at least had made some improvement over what we'd seen with chemotherapy. And I'm sorry this didn't come out, but the second randomization was that for those patients who completed their therapy, who had no evidence of um, active disease, they were then randomized to receive or not receive uh, isotretinoin, which is a drug that uh, induces differentiation. And what was shown is that the, uh, those patients who were randomized to this particular agent also had improved uh, event-free survival compared to those that um, did not receive uh, the isotretinoin, suggesting for the very first time that biologic agents, in addition to cytotoxic agents, can also lead to um, changes in outcome and improve the event-free survival. Subsequently, a landmark study was, um, was uh, conducted in which we uh, looked at patients who received induction and consolidation with transplant, and patients were then randomized to receive um, an antibody, and here it's called chimeric 1418 antibody, um, but sex subsequently it's been uh, named denetuximab, uh, and uh, plus cytokines, plus retinoic acid, which was um, isotretinoin, the differentiation agent, versus just the isotretinoin alone. And what we saw in this study was that immunotherapy also improved outcomes. So very much like what was seen with the retinoic acid, providing additional types and modalities of therapy following induction cytotoxic therapy, radiation, surgery, and consolidation therapy, uh, you could improve outcome uh, in this case with immunotherapy, cytokines, plus retinoic acid, and in this particular um, survival curve, you can see there's a 20% improvement in event-free survival. There was also an improvement in overall survival. I do want to remind you that this curve starts at the time of where this arrow is. So we're not taking this, this is not from the time of diagnosis, but rather this is from the time of initiating um, the immunotherapy. Um, but this was very, very exciting, completely transformed our, our thoughts about how to treat patients with neuroblastoma and demonstrated the significant efficacy of immunotherapy. Our last study that has been now published uh, also tested a more is better question. And in this particular study, we tested whether or not tandem cycles of myeloblative therapy followed by uh, autologous stem cell transplant would improve outcome over a single cycle of myeloblative therapy and stem cell uh, transplant. In this particular study, peripheral blood stem cells were used, not bone marrow um, stem cells. And what you can see, and this was published um, uh, in uh, uh, 2019 in uh, JAMA. But what you can see is that once again, we show that more is better. So intensifying consolidation with two cycles of myeloblative therapy and stem cell um, uh, and stem cell transplant improved uh, event-free survival. We also did a subsequent analysis using these data and we took a look at those patients who received tandem transplant and then subsequently received um, immunotherapy with denetuximab, retinoic acid, and cytokines. And you can see among the patients who received tandem transplant, these patients had better event-free survival than those patients who had a single transplant who then received the immunotherapy. Once again, I wanna remind you that this curve starts uh, at the time of um, the immunotherapy. So if you take a look at what's happened with uh, overall survival and event-free survival over the last several decades with the various clinical trials that we've conducted and the um, randomizations that we've demonstrated that are where one arm is better than the other arm, you can see there has been absolutely a steady, whoops, a steady improvement in um, both event-free survival as well as overall survival. And we're currently at approximately, um, uh, we see overall survival at approximately uh, 60%. And while we're thrilled to see this progressive improvement in event-free survival and overall survival, clearly we're not successfully treating all patients 
There's clearly more work to do. There are way too many patients that continue to relapse. Um, and there's also um, toxicities that's been associated with the therapy that we're, that we're providing. So this is the ongoing study in an effort to try to further improve outcome. Um, this study is specifically taking a look at two different targeted agents. Um, there's a randomization uh, looking at whether or not the introduction of radio-labeled MIBG, therapeutic MIBG, will or, it, during induction will or not will or will not improve event-free survival and overall survival. And we have also introduced um, the ALK inhibitor lorlatinib um, to those pa for those patients uh, for whom a ALK mutation is, um, is identified um, at the time of diagnosis in their tumors. So this study has uh, recently closed, closed to accrual and we are waiting for the final results and it'll take several years before we are able to learn whether or not adding in one of these targeted agents does indeed lead to um, improved outcome. I just want to comment that uh, in a little later this morning, uh, Dr. Mark, Mark Gachelian will be uh, presenting some additional details about North American clinical trials. Um, there's certainly during while we were doing all of these uh, clinical trials in uh, the children's oncology in North America, Cypin has also been conducting numerous clinical randomized trials. And I'm just showing you the very first uh, that uh, demonstrated that indeed uh, there was uh, an improved outcome based on the uh, in, uh, consolidation therapy that was given. And again, um, more details will be uh, presented by uh, Dr. Moreno a little later this morning. And I do, do just wanna mention that unfortunately, this is very, very intensive therapy and survivors unfortunately are at risk for very serious events. Um, this has been reported from patients who were treated decades ago. Um, and as the therapy has continued to in, in, in increase in intensity, uh, there's a COG study that's being run by Tara Henderson and Lisa Diller specifically to look at late effects after um, more modern high-risk therapy. Um, and we are uh, eagerly awaiting those results. And some early results were presented at ANR, which did show that there was a high incidence of ototoxicity. So um, risk-based treatment has improved outcomes. Classifiers will continue to be refined as we learn more about the biology. Uh, increasingly intensive multimodality treatments have led to improved survival for high-risk patients, but unfortunately this is associated with some significant late effects and clearly more effective therapies um, that are uh, less toxic are needed to treat this population. And I'd just like to acknowledge my colleagues in the IRNRG, COG, um, as well as the University of Chicago. And um, I will end now. Thank you, Dr. Cohen, for that uh, overview of both the evolution of staging and also um, an introduction into the changes over time in neuroblastoma and the sort of early indications of, you know, to, to the audience of how long it takes to develop. Um, and the risks associated with the developments as well in terms of more is better, but you know, let's think about late effects. So thank you very much. So uh, now it's over to Dr. Moreno, who will present on clinical trials on the opposite side of the ocean in Europe. Hi, <clears throat> hi everyone. Uh, it's uh, again great to be great to be here, and really thankful for the for the organizers. And I'll be providing this um, brief update on the clinical trials that are running in in Europe. These are my disclosures, and uh, <clears throat> I think this this the topic has been introduced by uh, Dr. Morgenstern and Cohen before, but just to um, to highlight again that why we do clinical trials and these the, they're the best way to scientifically evaluate new medicines or new combinations or new treatments or new regimens, and that the, these trials, particularly the better the, the randomized ones provide the evidence that we need to change practice across the globe. Um, and that sometimes um, requires, it, it, it requires a lot of time to complete them, uh, but that's what we've learned that we need to do to change practice by the doctors, by the regulators, by the healthcare systems, so that we can uh, continue improvement, improving outcomes. The trials 
are conducted and they use endpoint, what we call endpoints to measure success. And, and success can be the treatment is safe, the treatment is non-toxic, the, the treatment um, has good anti-tumor activity, and that by that we mean that the, the tumors are shrinking, um, or I, the best um, outcomes are uh, to show that a treatment improves survival. The, the final um, um, endpoint is, is to improve survival. So the aim uh, of the of the talk is to give a, a broad overview of the trials that have been either recently completed or are ongoing, and some hints of the uh, trials that will happen uh, soon uh, will be happening soon in in Europe. So just um, to highlight the components of uh, high risk therapy. As, as mentioned by, by Professor Cohn, uh, that are induction consolidation and post consolidation. They're the same um, both sides of the Atlantic. And in here in, in Europe, we are working and conducting the COPEN high risk neuroblastoma trial too, that um, it is open in, in a significant number of countries in uh, of Europe, but not open in, in all of them, but continues to, to increase the, the number of centers and countries that participate and at the moment it is evaluating one randomized question in induction with two different chemotherapy regimens it is evaluating the role of tandem transplant in as a way of consolidation and it is evaluating a different doses or a different way of giving radiotherapy and it, it we are planning or we are working to to amend it so that it also incorporates chemoimmunotherapy so chemotherapy with antigen to immunotherapy for patients with refractory disease and um, um, also incorporate ALK inhibitors for patients with um, ALK positive disease. But unfortunately, again, as, as Professor Cohn was mentioning, this treatment can fail. And there are two main ways of, fa of, of not working um, that I, we also wanted to, to clarify so that the, we are doing a big effort internationally to use the same terminology. So refractory disease is the patients that have refractory disease are those that have received induction chemotherapy and the the disease is either not responding at all it's stable or responding but very slowly so it, it's not clearing the metastatic disease so these are refractory what we call refractory disease and they do need a specific they have um uh, the outcomes are less good and they do need more intensified uh, treatment and then there are the patients with relapse disease that can also be progressive. Um, both situations, so relapse is when the disease has gone away, has responded, and then it appears back. And progressive is when there is disease and it grows. It doesn't stop um, growing with the, with the treatment. But both are kind of the worst scenario where we find ourselves when treating uh, children with high-risk neuroblastoma. The, the best treatment that we have that is induction consolidation and post consolidation is not working and the disease comes back and that's where i'll focus the the rest of the of the talk so if we take these patients the patients that um that have a high-risk neuroblastoma that relapses either with a progression with an early relapse or with a late relapse how do we manage these patients the um the the first recommendation is to give chemotherapy based regimen um ideally with um, in combination with um, anti-GD2 immunotherapy and also conduct molecular profiling of the tumor. So it is really important that if, if it hasn't been done at the beginning, um, at the time of diagnosis, at the time of relapse, the patient may have to be re-biopsied and then the, the, uh, a set of genes is analyzed to see if there are some genomic alterations, some alterations in the tumor that could be treated with uh, specific drugs and ALK is one of the, the examples. If we give this treatment and the tumor responds or stabilizes, then we have to give some um, consolidation uh, or maintenance options um, as we do in the in the frontline setting. Um, it's not to, to give everything the same, but to do a reinduction, some consolidation and some uh, maintenance treatment. However, um, so in terms of in terms of option, um, there are other options for the first regimen. Um, so not only chemotherapy with anti gd 2 immunotherapy, there have been recently the, the results of a trial testing a new regimen in Germany called RIST that is particularly useful for patients with MECAN amplification. The, we have used bevacizumab in the BEACON trial that I'll mention later. Um, and also the ALK inhibitors are being used in these patients uh, alone or in combination with chemotherapy. 
there are many, there are multiple trial options in the consolidation or maintenance setting. Some of them are outside trials, and they are um, MIBG therapy, low dose chemotherapy, immunotherapy, um, and there are different options in that have open clinical trials in in Europe, like uh, a trial with lutetium dotatate. Um, trials with target matched therapies with ALK inhibitors or other um, specific inhibitors. There are trials with a haploidentic transplant or recently completed with uh, CAR T cells for, for GD2. So the treatments that we give um, are largely uh, influenced by the availability of drugs across the globe, and there are significant disparities. Um, being this a, a global symposium, um, there, are, there will be countries where there's only chemotherapy that is available, that where um, bevacizumab or um, RIST may be available, an ALK inhibitor may or may not be available, chemotherapy with um, immunotherapy may or may not be available, and that's something that we're really working hard to make all these options available across the, the globe. The globe. So once a patient has got relapsed neuroblastoma, um, long-term survival is, is difficult to, to achieve. Um, although we know that it is improving over time. It was really, really difficult um, 20 or, or 30 years ago, and um, slowly it is um, getting better, but there's definitely a lot of, a lot of work to, to do. And <clears throat> this approach is generally valid for um, the whole of the, of the world, but for example, in terms of consolidation or maintenance options, there are many options that, and there's no clarity of which of the options show uh, better results. So we do need to work um, internationally to, to improve this. And then, the, patient, the treatment for first relapse may not work, and we would need to, um, to try second and subsequent relapse uh, options. And there, there are a lot more options, both sides of the, of the Atlantic. In Europe, we would do this through the, the work that we do in the, in the ITCC consortium that develops early phase trials for, um, for these patients. So one brief mention of the BEACON trial that we conducted in, in 10 European countries over eight years, and it recruited more than 200 patients and is now completed. It first just tested three chemotherapy regimens with or without bevacizumab, and then it tested chemotherapy with and without dinotuximab beta. Um, for the first part, we uh, the, the result that, that uh, uh, stands out better is the combination of bevacizumab with irinotecan and temozolomide um, that had a from um, a response rate of 30%. So one in three patients, the, the tumor um, shrank, the tumor responded. Um, and then um, it also had a, an interesting uh, progression-free survival, as is the only um, survival curve that shows different results in, in this group. And the second part of the trial was testing chemoimmunotherapy, in this case with dinotuximab beta and topotic and temozolomide. Um, and uh, Dr. Gray will, will share some more details, but again, um, this gave a um, strong response uh, result in that the patients had much better results in progression-free survival when using chemotherapy with dinotuximab beta with anti-GD2 than uh, just chemotherapy alone. The key learning points um, that we that we that we learned with the with the beacon trial is that there were two positive two regimens that gave a positive signal, the bevacizumab and the dinotuximab beta in combination with chemotherapy, um, that we that using multi-arm uh, designs is useful. And these are trials that can be adapted as we go through. Um, and that for such a rare disease and when trials take very long time to, to set up in internationally, it's useful and it, it makes us be faster. Um, that we have to give a different treatment for patients with relapse and refractory disease. And then that the trials that we do for patients with relapse have to be good trials for patients with relapse disease, but they can also be good options to bring into frontline. And chemoimmunotherapy is a, is a good example because um, it was developed initially developed in in frontline in relapse setting, but we are now thinking um, across the globe on how to how to test this um, upfront. We are um, learning some potential improvements to the chemoimmunotherapy in terms of the dose, the duration, which chemotherapy to, to use it, and, and other agents to, to improve their, their results. And we also learned that the dialogue with the regulators is crucial because we finished the trial, we got really good results, but now it's not so easy to make sure that all the countries can adapt clinical practice and, and uh, start using it. So we are launching, we're now working to launch the Beacon 2 clinical trial, which is a its continuation 
um, which uh, we're working to, to open um, early next year. Um, and it will have a large randomization with different, um, with different arms. Um, initially, we'll start with the winners of Beacon uh, 1, with the Dinizuxima, Beta, and, and Bevacizima, but it will also have other arms that we're calling Tier 2 to test new combinations, to develop new combinations, and we're working to have combinations of chemoimmunotherapy that improve um, the results that we that we already have. And, and as I say, we're planning to open this uh, global trial um, quite soon. For uh, for subsequent relapses, as I mentioned, we work with ITCC, and this is not a comprehensive list, but it's, uh, it's just to show that there are some biomarker-driven trials, for example, for ALK-positive uh, neuroblastomas. There are other targeted agents, several of them with a neuroblastoma focus, um, so drugs that um, target different vulnerabilities, as, as Daniel uh, was um, mentioning that have been that have an have an important interest for neuroblastoma and then different immunotherapy combinations so the, the bottom line is um that there are now there are more trials and more targets they are more neuroblastoma driven they are more there are more combinations and there are more sort of advanced in the clinical development they're not just the phase one but they move to from phase one to what we call phase one b to phase two but still um there are significant challenges because it's continues to be difficult to engage pharmaceutical companies um, to make to do pediatric trials. Some of the drugs are useful just for very small groups of patients, so we do need um, still more trials um, open, um, and it is still difficult to conduct um, academic trials, so the ones that are not uh, sponsored by a pharmaceutical company. In CEOPEN, we are trying to do this a prioritization process, which is with, that we share with all the physicians kind of a color code um, of all the trials that are open in different situations at the first relapse, at the second relapse. Um, so we, we give a high priority, and that's the, the green color, so that physicians and patients can know what are the trial options available across Europe and um, sort of prioritize if it's worth traveling for these options. Um, because some of the trials may be interesting to have if, if they're available in your center or in your country or close to home, but maybe not worth traveling across Europe for, um, whereas others um, will definitely be the, be the case where patients should be prioritized. So we're trying um, to do a lot of work to uh, disseminate the options to, the, to all doctors and, and parents across Europe. Um, the ESMAR trial is an example of a trial with many arms that is um, has been developed by the team in, in Gustave Roussy in, in France. And according to the patient's tumor profile, so the characteristics of the of the tumor, um, the patients are assigned into one or another arm, hoping that that um, assignment, that enrichment will will work fine. So with this, I'll, I'll conclude. Um, highlighting that we are really seeing major advances in, in clinical trials for relapsed neuroblastoma these days, and we've seen recent results of ALK um, inhibitors, CAR T cells, chemoimmunotherapy. Um, there are several randomized clinical trials ongoing uh, at, for relapsed patients. There's one in the US in COG. There have been um, others in by the NANT group, by the German group, by the COPEN group. So there are numerous um, trials on, ongoing. Still, we face numerous operational challenges to have them open across all of the European countries. And that means that often the, the patients lack uh, trial options. And we, we need to work on that. And um, the, we hope that the upcoming trials will be more efficient because the clinical trials will be better designed, but also because the science behind the trials um, it is continuously improving and we're testing better combinations. We're also working in, in enhancing and improving the collaboration between all the stakeholders with scientists, clinicians, regulators, pharma and advocates um, across the globe so that we can speed up uh, drug development for, for neuroblastoma. And we will continue doing this over, over the next uh, years. So with this, um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much to all our international collaborators and, uh, and I look forward to the discussion later. Thank you very much, Dr. Moreno, for that overview of the clinical trials in Europe and also uh, information and examples of how those trials differ between diagnosis, first relapse, refractory treatment, etc. cetera. Um, so in a slight change to running order, now I'm gonna hand you over to Professor Gray, who's gonna to talk to a uh, subject of immu immunotherapies and neuroblastoma, um, a, question, or a topic I know is close to the heart of many of the uh, parents here is understanding 
how that works and what's available. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's lovely to be here um, and to be at the meeting again. So what I'd like to do um, in the next um, 15 minutes is to give um, a brief uh, overview of how immunotherapy has changed the treatment for neuroblastoma and what's what's now established as a standard of care as part of neuroblastoma treatment and what um, is coming in terms of experimental treatment and how immunotherapy can be improved. So the rationale for using immunotherapy in any cancer is that it potentially offers a far more specific treatment to kill cancer cells and chemotherapy. Chemotherapy kills any cells that are dividing and growing and the immune system can potentially recognise cancer cells that have different proteins or molecules on their surface than normal cancer cells, just as it can recognise infection, bacteria or viruses. And so we know that uh, the, the, the immune system can recognise tumours just as it can re recognise infections, but the immune response that it makes to um, cancers is generally not very effective, it's weak, um, and partly because the tumour is not very different from normal tissues of the body and so the, it's not very foreign to the immune system, but also because most tumours, um, including neuroblastoma, are quite clever at finding ways to avoid the immune system and to find ways to circumvent any attempts that the immune system has to, um, to eradicate tumour. But we do know that when um, when immune responses are found in tumours, and we can see that when we look at, um, at the histology of tu tu neuroblastoma, when you can see immune cells in the tumour, then that correlates with better prognosis and outcome. So the idea of immunotherapy is to try and use this, to try and use the specificity that um, immunotherapy potentially offers to um, manipulate that immune response and somehow make it effective to treat the cancer. And by doing that, we hope that you can provide a more um, a, a treatment which has less uh, side effects and toxicities than conventional treatments. So the main different types of immunotherapy that have been used in neuroblastoma um, are three different things. Uh, one of them is um, antibody th um, therapies, so anti-GD2 antibodies, and those are antibodies that are made um, in, the, in, in the lab or in a factory uh, and then injected into the body. And the, the idea is that the anti-GD2 antibody binds to one of the molecules on the surface of the neuroblastoma cells, so GD2, and then uh, allows um, cells of the patient's immune system to come and um, eat up the tumour cell. So I'll talk quite mostly about anti-GD2 antibodies as those have been most widely used in, in the treatment of neuroblastoma over the last decade. Secondly, uh, CAR T cells, which are uh, uh, immune cells of the body which have been manipulated to particularly target proteins or molecules on tumour cells. And have been, um, there's been a number of trials over the last few years looking at whether these can be used in neuroblastoma. And uh, finally, I'll talk about uh, vaccine uh, therapies whereby you're um, injecting um, um, a protein or molecule into the patient to try and make the patient's own immune system mount an immune response, which is hopefully long lasting. And I'll touch on those at the end. So anti-GD2 antibodies have uh, been used um, in neuroblastoma for um, over two decades now. GD2 is a, a molecule that's on almost all neuroblastoma cells and it's at really high levels. So most neuroblastoma cells have over a million molecules of the GD2 on the surface. Um, so it's a really good target for, for immunotherapies. There's been several um, different um, anti-GD2 antibodies that have been used clinically. Um, so there's dinatuximab beta, uh, which has been largely um, uh, used in Europe. Uh, there's dinatuximab or unituxin, which has been largely used in the United States. There's been uh, natixumab or humanized 3F8, which was developed at Memorial Sloan Kettering and is now uh, owned and marketed by YMABS. And then there's a humanized 1418 K3T2 antibody, which was initially generated at St. Jude's. And all of those, uh, three of those antibodies have marketing approval, um, but all of them have been uh, widely used in neuroblastoma. None of them have been directly compared in clinical trials, so we don't know of those four antibodies which is the best, whether any of them is superior in terms of the, the actions that they have and the efficacy in neuroblastoma. So the, the landscape really changed um, in uh, 2010 when this landmark study was uh, published by the Children's Oncology Group in the United States, which Dr. Cohen has already mentioned, when 
uh, anti-GD2 antibody was given to children with high-risk neuroblastoma after they'd completed the um, high-dose chemotherapy elements of their um, uh, standard treatment uh, and given in addition to retinoic acid as maintenance therapy. And it was given in the trial with uh, two other um, injections, interleukin-2 and GMCSF, with the idea that those, those cytokine molecules would boost the patient's own immune cells so that when the tumour cells were coated with the anti-GD2 antibody, there'd be more immune cells in the patient to come and gobble up the tumour cells. So all of the patients in the study um, got the anti-GD2 antibody, which is dinatuximab. They got IL-2 and GMCSF. And uh, half of the patients got just standard treatment and half of the patients got standard treatment plus the anti-GD2, IL-2 and GMCSF. And what you can see here on this is um, survival curve, which shows the number of children who are alive without any relapse, the event-free survival, is that at two years, 20% more children uh, were free of relapse than those who had not had the antibody, which was really an extraordinary result and, and changed practice across the world. And since that, that study, anti-GD2 has been incorporated as maintenance treatment uh, in both um, the United States and Europe. But although that was really exciting and encouraging, there's still a large number of children with high-risk neuroblastoma that relapse despite that treatment, so it, we need to further improve the effectiveness of it. And also, giving the anti-GD2 antibody was associated with significant pain and also other side effects because the GD2 molecule is also found on pain nerve fibres. Um, and so there's been work over the subsequent decades to look at how, both how we can make the antibody more effective, but also how we can reduce those side effects. So since then, over the last decade, we've um, conducted studies in Europe in the um, SARP and HIRIS-1 study, which have, although it's not directly compared the um, antibody with th that used in the American studies, has produced very similar results. Also in Europe, we found that uh, the IL-2 element of the uh, treatment um, doesn't really improve the outcome of patients, but it does significantly increase the side effects. So across uh, both America and Europe, we have dropped giving IL-2 as part of the treatment, which has made it more tolerable for patients. Thirdly, we found in the European trials that by slowing down the infusion to give it continuously over 10 days by these pumps, which are shown here on the on the right, it makes it more, um, more tolerable. The pain is much less and many patients can now be treated uh, with the, the antibody delivered as a, an outpatient uh, coming in and out for checkups rather than staying in hospital for the whole time of the infusion. So the other major thing that has happened in the last decade is that we've uh, become aware of the benefits of giving chemotherapy with immunotherapy together. So this was initially counterintuitive because we thought that chemotherapy kills immune cells and it might thwart the effects of giving um, the immunotherapy. But actually, we found that there's uh, very promising results when you give both together. So there's now been a number of studies, both in Europe and in, uh, in America, which have shown that in patients with, re this was tested first in patients with relapsed and refractory disease, as most new treatments are, that when you give um, anti-GD2 antibody with chemotherapy, uh, the results are much seem to be much better than when you give chemotherapy alone. And so here is um, data on the right from, this is survival curves from um, the um, a, 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 an American study, and there's been similar data produced um, uh, for other antibodies. So in Europe, we've tested this within the Beacon uh, Immuno study. So uh, Lucas mentioned earlier about the Beacon study, which compared different antibody backbones and whether the addition of bevacizumab improved outcome. The, when that bit of the study completed, we uh, amended the study to look at whether the addition of dinatuximab uh, beta, the European anti-GD2 antibody, um, improved outcome. And in the study, we had uh, 65 patients, two thirds of them who received chemotherapy with the anti-GD2 and one third or 22 patients who received it, uh, just received chemotherapy alone. And you can see here on the left that the response rate was roughly double. Uh, so it was 35 percent of patients had a, a shrinkage of their tumour uh, when they had the antibody treatment, whereas only 18 percent had a response when the uh, chemotherapy was given alone. And this also translated into improvement in the uh, progression-free survival, the number of children who don't uh, progress. The top line um, on this graph is those children who have the antibody treatment with the chemotherapy. Um, 
So those were clearly uh, really promising results. And there's consistent data now from uh, across Europe and America supporting this concept. Just to context, although we haven't com compared them directly, uh, uh, Lucas mentioned that the, the bit, the bevacizumab um, and chemotherapy arm of the beacon trial look particularly promising. That's on the top there, the top line there is the, the, the survival of, of children who've had the bit chemotherapy regime. And just for comparison, below is children in the beacon immuno arm who had dinituximab beta plus chemotherapy. And although we can't directly compare these, we can see that the outcomes seem to be broadly similar with BIT and uh, chemoimmunotherapy. Therefore, as, as Lucas also mentioned in the next um, European uh, relapse study, Beacon 2, which we hope will open in the UK in early 2024, we will directly compare the BIT um, uh, regimen with dinituximab beta plus immunotherapy and we'll also look at whether there's any value in giving all both of the agents together so bevacizumab, dinituximab beta and, immu uh, and chemotherapy together and whether there's new combinations that we can test to further improve the efficacy of the chemotherapy um, and we hope that will be opening um, uh, early next year. In parallel to that, uh, uh, people have looked at giving chemotherapy as part of the upfront treatment of neuroblastoma in induction treatment. And there's been an, a number of studies in the US, which have uh, particularly uh, Sarah Federico's study, which is at the top there, which showed very good response rates in children who received the humanized 1418 K3T2 and A antibody in addition to induction chemotherapy, with a, almost uh, with 97% of patients receiving a, at least a partial response by the end of induction. And similar studies are happening uh, in, in the COG group and also within Europe. We have a, a pilot study which will test giving dinituximab beta with induction chemotherapy, which we hope will open early next year. What we don't know is if chemotherapy, if chemoimmunotherapy is given as part of induction therapy, whether there will still be benefit giving it as maintenance and whether you can reap the benefits of giving it twice or whether you get just get all the benefit up front if you give it during induction treatment. Um, so we've also looked at whether there's other ways of improving the um, efficacy of anti-GD2 antibody, whether there's other things that we can combine with um, uh, anti-GD2 to make it more effective. And um, uh, in particular, I've looked at, we've uh, had the minivan trial, which has been um, funded by Solving Kids Cancer and Partners and have um, looked at combining um, anti-GD2 with uh, MIBG therapy, so uh, MIBG therapy or targeted radiotherapy together with um, nivolumab, which is another monoclonal antibody. The rationale for this is that there are immune effects of radiotherapy in this trial given as MIBG therapy, which makes the immune environment of the tumour more favourable. Um, but there's also potentially immune effects and benefits of giving a checkpoint blockade inhibitor, such as anti-PD-1 with the anti-GD2. And that's been shown by um, uh, colleagues in Greifswald and uh, Wisconsin in preclinical work. In addition, um, Holger Loder in Greifswald in Germany has published some case reports uh, where children who had had um, disease, uh, neuroblastoma that was refractory or, pro or progressed through anti-GD2 therapy responded when uh, nivolumab or anti-PD-1 therapy was added, suggesting there may be benefit to giving both together. So in the trial, all patients get uh, MIBG therapy, um, all patients get anti-PD-1 therapy in the form of nivolumab, and then we had a dose escalation of the anti-GD2, the dinituximab beta, the first cohort of patients didn't get anti-GD2, second co cohort got a 50% dose, and the final cohort got the full dose of 100% um, um, antibody. The treatment is over just over six months. The patients start with getting uh, MIBG therapy with two doses at the beginning, and then they have six months of the combined immunotherapy um, with the anti-GD2 um, anti every six weeks and anti-PD-1 uh, every two weeks. Um, it's, the trial has been open to most patients with relapse and refractory neuroblastoma, providing they've got some MIBG avid disease. It's been open um, both in America and in uh, UK and is opening soon in Germany. We're, we've recruited 32 patients uh, and on the final cohort of patients. We've just completed the recruitment of the planned 18 patients for the final cohort, but we're hoping to extend it further and to recruit some more patients uh, because we're encouraged by the results that we've seen. 
So finally, um, because I know we're running uh, short on time, just to mention the two other types of immunotherapy which uh, are more experimental and not as widely used. The first, and you'll hear more about later, about CAR T-cells. So CAR T-cells, a bit like antibody therapies, are made in the lab and then given to the patient. Um, And they put the advantage over antibody therapies is they potentially offer long-term immunity because they last in the body for much longer. The results um, in leukemia for CAR T-cells have been really encouraging for um, childhood leukemias. But in general, the results for solid tumours have been uh, more disappointing because partly because it's it's perhaps harder for these um, T cells to get into the tumours. But there have been a number of studies in neuroblastoma and there's been some really encouraging data um, published uh, early this year from the Children's Hospital in Rome by Franco Locatelli, uh, which showed a response rate of 63% in children with relapsed and refractory neuroblastoma who were given CAR T cells. And what was really encouraging was that these CAR T cells were still in the patient's um, blood and circulation uh, two and a half years after they've had the treatment. Um, so we're hoping that trunk, that, con- that, that, that CAR T cell that was tested in Rome can be tested more widely in Europe. Um, and there'll also be a CAR T cell, a different CAR T cell, but um, a similar opening at Great Ormond Street in early next year. And finally, just to mention the uh, GD2, GD3 bivalent vaccine. Uh, so this the, the, this is different from the other two treatments, and it's given when children are in remission, uh, so when they've finished their standard of treatment. And the idea is that if you immunise children with the, the vaccine to GD2 and GD3, that they then produce their own anti-GD2 antibodies, which last um, long term in the circulation and reduce the risk of relapse. We know that so the antibody that's been used, as, the vaccine that has been used, has been developed in Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York and is now owned by YMAMS. And we know that it's it's safe to give. We know that um, it, you can induce an immune response, an antibody response in patients with it. It's given us uh, seven doses over a year um, and it, it's generally very well tolerated with few side effects. Um, But what we don't know yet is whether it's actually effective in preventing relapse, because when children get to the end of their treatment, if they're in remission at that point, their prognosis is actually much better than at the beginning and uh, diagnosis. It's very hard to do a study um, on these on children in that situation without testing it in a randomised way against another treatment to know whether the prognosis of these children when they're given the vaccine is better than it would be if they'd just been observed. But we do know in patients that when you do get high levels of antibody from the vaccine, that the outcome is better, which is encouraging that it is doing something. So what we'd like to do and hope to do is to be able to do um, uh, an international randomised trial of the vaccine to really prove uh, whether or not it works, uh, because that would be crucial to, in order to make it available for all children if it, if it is a benefit. So finally, just to conclude, Um, I hope I've shown you that immunotherapy potentially offers a very specific way to treat cancer, which has less side effects than um, uh, other conventional treatments such as chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Anti-GD2 maintenance therapy is now an established part of neuroblastoma treatment for children with high-risk disease. And over the last um, uh, few years, giving anti-GD2 with chemotherapy has shown increasing promise. The BEACON trial in, in Europe We'll test this further and see whether other novel combinations can further enhance chemoimmunotherapy. And the minivan trial has tested combining anti-GD2 with MIPG therapy and anti-PD-1. CAR T cells are showing promise but are still experimental. And anti, uh, the GD2, GD3 vaccine is safe and generates an immune response, but we don't know yet whether it's effective and a, a randomised trial is needed. And I'd just finally like to end by thanking um, all the uh, people who have funded and supported uh, these trials, but also the the children and families who've taken part in them. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gray, for that uh, introduction into um, immunotherapy, uh, covering the three aspects, uh, antibodies, CAR T cells and vaccine, and, and for the emphasis on what's the current practice, what's the near term future look like, and then what's the longer term future look like? So thank you for that. Um, in in the, our last talk now is going to be uh, delivered by Dr. Mara Chellian, um, who is going to give us an overview of the clinical trials in North America. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, I am uh, 
very glad to be presenting here. I'll try and see if I can do a little bit of catch up uh, since uh, many of our uh, colleagues have already spoken generally on some of the trials. Next slide, please. Uh, so what I'm going to try to do is highlight some of the recent results of some of the clinical trial data in the United States um, and uh, touch upon some of the ongoing clinical trials and what's coming uh, next in, uh, in the next uh, early part of 2024. Next slide. So you heard this part already. Um, I just wanted to lay out and remind everyone uh, what Dr. Cohn reminded you of, of what the standard in uh, the U.S. is for uh, our uh, high-risk therapy, and that includes an induction, a consolidation with the tandem transplant, and the dinatuximab immunotherapy, uh, and this uh, was uh, based on the results of the COG trial uh, that was led by Dr. Park. Next slide. Um, so I'm going to then talk about um, what is the rationale for the current ongoing uh, clinical trial. And um, here you can see, I think everyone is familiar with MIBG therapy. But we do know that there have been many sequential clinical trials that have documented activity in relapse refractory disease, and tolerability has been well documented. And so pilot study within COG showed tolerability in the upfront neuroblastoma patients. Next slide. So, uh, subsequent to that, um, in the NAND consortium, uh, we uh, studied the activity of uh, lorlatinib, which is an ALK inhibitor for patients with ALK aberrations. This study included both adults and pediatrics um, with different cohorts. So cohort A1 here is the pediatrics and A2 was the adult and a cohort B2, which was the combination uh, with chemotherapy of cyclophosphamide and topotecan. Um, and um, this study was a phase one uh, dose finding study, but we also looked at um, a response in the setting of uh, the phase one study. Um, the uh, agent was uh, tolerable um, and had a very favorable adverse uh, event profile. Um, and, and you can see on the bottom there, uh, there were very uh, encouraging uh, response rates uh, in all cohorts um, uh, with the chemotherapy cohort, um, at least in the pediatrics uh, group, um, uh, potentially showing an increased uh, response with chemotherapy and lorlatinib. Um, and as you can see, um, the graphs here show um, a response of um, um, uh, here is the MIBG Curie score, and you can see that uh, there are many patients who have uh, very nice responses uh, there with uh, the lorlatinib. So this was very encouraging and presented with Dr. Goldsmith. And um, so next slide. So based on these two uh, data, the uh, study ANBL 1531 uh, uh, was uh, amended to add lorlatinib. Uh, to the uh, therapy uh, that includes the post-maintenance uh, therapy there with lorlatinib and uh, randomizing the question of whether or not MIBG uh, would uh, make a difference in outcome in our patients. So this study, we would be looking forward to the results. The first part of the results we will be getting um, uh, in the next uh, uh, shorter time, uh, the uh, lorlatinib um, results may take a little bit longer as uh, more patients are, still need to be accrued on that arm. Next slide. And so where do we take this uh, uh, next? And you know, what are we doing with uh, uh, relapse refractory disease in MIBG? So I'm going to be talking about really some of the NAND trials here, uh, since some of the other ones have already been presented. Next slide. Uh, so, so this was the basis uh, of our uh, last large uh, neuroblastoma MIBG study that compared MIBG uh, when it's given with alone versus Irinotecan and Vincristine and uh, 
and also for varenostat as another arm. So patients were randomized into one of those three arms. And the study presented by Dr. Du Bois showed that the varenostat arm um, had a, a improved uh, response rate um, in this cohort. So this um, uh, study uh, really changed the way we have been giving MIBG in the United States for our relapse refractory disease with burners that MIBG becoming what are uh, quote unquote standard uh, for uh, uh, this disease. Next slide. Um, while this was ongoing, uh, we had already initiated a trial with MIBG with dinatuximab, as you can imagine. Uh, these are both very active agents, and the thought process was that uh, they could uh, be uh, helpful to be um, in the same patient population. Um, and, uh, and we conducted that uh, trial, you can see on the top, um, and um, we, uh, the preliminary results here of NAN1701 showed a 44% response rate in that. Uh, group. And then when we, uh, the results of the uh, Varinostat MIBG came along, we added also Varinostat uh, in this uh, cohort. Uh, and there's a very good uh, preclinical rationale of these things working uh, uh, together uh, synergistically. And you can see um, uh, we had a nice response rate of that cohort uh, in that figure down below. And um, uh, this data is still uh, being centrally reviewed, but uh, certainly quite encouraging uh, for all these uh, groups of uh, MIBG studies. So since that data, next slide, we have now um, uh, then come up with a new trial that's uh, upcoming, uh, which uh, looks at uh, trying to understand which one of these arms that I just presented uh, would be uh, the optimal arm. So this is the next phase two study, randomized, where we are looking at either MIBG with Bernastat, the current standard, and then the two arms that I just discussed from the NAN1701 study, which include the Dinatuximab and the Bernastat. Next slide. So switching gears, you already have heard about chemoimmunotherapy and how much um, uh, that the results of our ANBL-1221 have uh, really uh, changed the landscape of what we do with our relapse refractory uh, patients. And uh, uh, we have uh, now uh, called this our standard uh, for our uh, first relapse patients. And, uh, uh, and but we need to build from there, and we need to see how we can improve it. Next slide. Uh, so the first um, uh, thought process here is to think about how does that affect our upfront therapy. Um, and there were two trials that have uh, been led to look at the uh, uh, when you combine it in induction therapy. There was an initial St. Jude trial and a, a COG trial, uh, and you can see some uh, 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 preliminary uh, data there. Next slide. Um, and we uh, then, of course, now have uh, decided that uh, since those have been um, favorable, that we would uh, do a randomized study with a standard induction versus induction with immunotherapy. And if we have a good response, you can continue. However, uh, with, uh, in a poor response, patients would then get extended induction with chemoimmunotherapy. And this trial will be opening in 2024 in the early phases. Next slide. Um, and uh, what else has been going on with chemotherapy in the relapse setting? Uh, ANBL 1821, which is a randomized study that added the FMO to iranotecantemazolamide. This study uh, is uh, almost complete, um, and we look forward to those results. So this, I think we have a few more patients. Uh, there are a few other studies uh, that are looking at chemotherapy. Uh, uh, Abimacyclib, which is a CDK4-6 uh, inhibitor, uh, is being combined with chemotherapy, and there's also a rapid uh, infusion of and the um, with chemoimmunotherapy um, uh, in a two hour uh, time period that is ongoing. And we look forward to those results. Next slide. 
So where do we go from here? Chemo-immunotherapy therapy um, is exciting, uh, and we, but we need to figure out are there other ways to improve it? Uh, and here comes the NK cells who are, um, uh, which are uh, good killers in neuroblastoma. However, we need to see if we can uh, improve them. And the two ways to look at that is whether we can make, uh, have better NK cells or N activate these NK cells. Uh, further. Next slide. So the two ways, so better NK cells, this is the study 2101, which is uh, looking at universal donor NK cells, the STINK trial. Uh, these NK cells are collected from donors in a bank. Uh, they're selected to be the best kind of donors based on biology of the NK cells that are the best killers. And they've really been educated around what's called TGF data and printing to be resistant to immunosuppression that is common in neuroblastoma. Uh, so the this trial will be uh, opening in early 2024 as well, um, and uh, patients uh, with any relapse number uh, will be able to uh, enroll on it, um, and this will be a phase two study to look at response rate. Excellent. And uh, the other study that's coming down the line, I think we uh, was touched on uh, a little bit before, uh, is a study called Honeybee Trial. Uh, it's uh, using uh, N803, which is an IL-15 super agonist. Mainly, uh, this is the part where uh, we are trying to enhance these cells and uh, make them more active. Um, this is an agent that's tolerable in adults, uh, and it's given subcutaneously. And this trial will then uh, be randomizing uh, Q1418 K322A, um, the uh, antibody uh, that was initially produced in St. Jude with erinotecan, temozolomide, and GMCSF, uh, with or without N803. Next slide. So um, uh, what else is out there? We talked about radioimmunotherapy. We talked about chemoimmunotherapy. Of course, there's a whole area uh, that we uh, need to work on uh, further is targeting them again. Um, and uh, uh, there are a few trials in the space uh, that are ongoing in the United States uh, with the two uh, main categories of CDK4 and, and six uh, inhibitors, which uh, mainly uh, deal with cellular transition from G1 phase to another cell cycle to the S phase. And so these uh, studies ribocyclib uh, with uh, topotecantemazolamide and pelbocyclib with cyclotopo uh, uh, are ongoing currently. Um, in addition, PARP inhibitors um, are uh, also being used, and uh, you can see here talosaparib and olaparib are uh, uh, both being uh, used in this setting. Next slide. Um, and uh, the last trial, which is not a, a therapeutic trial that I just want to mention, is the MFBG PET phase three study that is ongoing that's comparing uh, this PET to MIBG, which is a standard imaging. Um, and uh, this may have higher sensitivity to detect disease. Uh, however, we'll need to understand prognostic significance. Uh, it is a quicker scan with no thyroid protection required. So uh, we, uh, this study is ongoing and uh, we shall see um, uh, in the early 2024, hopefully with some results. Next slide. Um, and really the point here is, is um, we have been uh, making steady uh, progress here. Um, it uh, appears that there are just random trials, one after the other, but each one builds on the other. And um, all this uh, building uh, on top of each other then uh, has been raising our event-free survival and overall survival. And hopefully uh, we can continue that um, as we, uh, uh, explore all these studies. Next slide. So I hope um, to just uh, remind you that I think our therapies are really involving um, and our relapse refractory disease um, uh, space is really encouraging, uh, but also uh, very helpful in the design of our upfront trials. But we do have a long road ahead, uh, but that long road, of course, will need to be with collaboration with the whole group. And so I thank everyone here, patient, families, and advocates, collaborators, and our funding sources. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Dr. Maritellian, for that uh, overview of the trials, uh, recent successes and future work in the US. Um, that brings us to the end of our formal presentations. Um, what I'd like to do now is there's been huge activity on the uh, question stream. So I'd like to uh, present a couple of those questions to the panel. Um, some, are, some are specific to specific uh, presenters, uh, but feel free to tackle any question that, that we're presented. So starting off, um, one of the um, uh, questions that's come in is on MIBG therapy. And the question is, if a child has not had a successful stem cell harvest uh, prior to MIBG, can they still go forward to MIBG? So I'll throw that open to whoever on the panel would like to start on that one. Shall I go no, first? So I, so I think I it depends on this. Yeah, MIBG can also. be given. <laughs> MIBG can, oh, okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, so MIBG can be given at different doses and at higher doses. It, it, it does deplete the bone marrow and sure stem cells anyone, are essential. If, if everyone's off mute there, can they make sure they're off mute if there's anyone responding? Do you want me to carry on? No. Uh. Okay. Okay. Uh, you know, if no, if if that if that's not if that question is not um, if no one wants to tackle that question, um, which was, um, you know, if a child has not had successful stem cell harvest prior to MIBG, is it appropriate to continue with MIBG or to progress into MIBG therapy? I think I think we can probably answer it. So I think I think for for most MIBG treatment, the doses of MIBG given are are such that the bone bone marrow is quite depleted and stem cell rescue is needed. Um, in the minivan trial, we're using a non myeloablative dose, so a lower dose, but we've still, as a trial requirement, required stem cells to be stored in case there's unexpected um, myelosuppression and and delay in the bone marrow recovery. So I think certainly in the UK. We would normally um, in, insist on having some bone marrow, some stem cells um, frozen as a, as, a, as a safety measure. And the same thing on um, and the U.S. continent. I think um, uh, there are um, some uh, studies or palliative doses of MIBG that have been used without uh, stem cell, but you really have to pay attention to the dose uh, so mm -hmm. that uh, the toxicity profile could be favorable for the patient. Okay, thanks guys. Uh, another question or group of questions came in around 11Q uh, deletion. And one of the questions was, while we've heard lots of um, therapies, et cetera, addressing like the alt mutations, et cetera, um, is there, why is there not more research into using uh, um, 11G as a, or 11Q as a deletion as a druggable uh, target? Uh, is that possible? And is there any research in this area? Because it's a significant prognostic factor. Um, I think no, no, there are actually uh, lots of investigations ongoing in this area. Clearly, it is an area that, of interest to all of us. Uh, the agents uh, that uh, may be possible there uh, are evolving, and so I do think there might be some trials coming up in the next year, uh, but um, I think uh, it's still a little bit early enough that it wasn't included in some of these presentations. Yeah, yeah I, I would add that the fact that, that a, a marker is prognostic does not mean that there is a treatment. Are there any other uh, comments? A treatment um, straight, straight away. Um, so in this, in this case, it, for for ALK, it's very clear that it is an oncogenic driver. There are ALK inhibitors, and there is a group of patients with a prognostic um, significance. But that doesn't happen for every biomarker. So there have more research it has to happen until we, we know the, the right drugs or the right way to target these, these patients. But it is definitely work in progress.
Okay, so on to the next question. Uh, there's two two kind of clinical trial progress questions here, um, one from either side of the ocean. The first is, uh, is there any more information on when Beacon 2 will open and where it will be available? And also on a trial I'm unfamiliar with is AOH1966. So perhaps we could answer that. Yeah, the first one was Beacon 2? Yeah, so for Beacon 2, is, we are aiming to open it in 17 Euro, uh, countries, many, many European countries, and Israel, Canada, no, not Canada, Israel, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, and we are looking for, for more countries interested on, on joining. Um, we have incorporated most of the countries that are part of the ITCC consortium. So um, at the moment, we are working on the submissions uh, on the regulatory approvals for the UK. Um, so we are hoping that it will open first in the UK in the in the first quarter of the of the next year. Um, we're, we're working on the final version of the protocol, the final version of all the documents that you have to submit. So it will open first in the UK, and then there is a um, a system for the European Union countries um, that will hopefully open most of them um, during the during the next year. Um, so it is not. Um, if Has it is, anybody anything it, to add to that? Uh, please, or if not, we'll go on to the next question. No? Okay. Um, so the next question is a very specific one. Um, have, how common is the repeat use of high-dose chemotherapy with associated stem cell transplant as part of a relapse treatment across the globe? So that's in a relapse scenario. How common is it that we would use um, high dose chemotherapy with stem cell treatment. So on the US side, that's not a very common um, uh, practice uh, since uh, many of our patients do get high dose chemotherapy in the upfront setting. Um, uh, the focus has uh, more been on uh, targeted therapy uh, and or immunotherapy and other agents. Yeah, I think the approach in Europe is generally similar. Yeah, it, it seems we're having some some problems with the uh, with the audio and uh, and the moderator, um, so we're trying to to figure that out. Um, is there, uh, for example, uh, in, there was one question that someone could discuss the AOH 1996 trial. Um, do you know, do you know Sue or, or us about it? No, we don't. We don't. Okay. And um, there's another question. Uh, if we can get DFMO now in Europe, now that FDA approved it. I, I can, I can answer. I, yeah. <laughs> so it, the, there was a presentation to the FDA about the data, I think that um, Daniel shared with many of you here. Um, and the advisory committee, the oncology drug advisory committee did vote to um, approve the drug, but that does not, they, they're advising the leaders of the FDA to consider approving the drug, but it has not been officially approved. So we haven't, we do not have official FDA approval as of yet. We've merely had the ODAC committee uh, suggesting and, and advising that this is a drug that should be considered for approval. Yeah. And to our knowledge, it, it has not been possible to get access to DFMO in, in Europe, other, other than in the, in the US sites where the trials have been. Uh, does anyone want to comment on the combinations with PD-1 inhibitors? Uh, that there are a couple of questions of combinations of nivolumab <laughs> or the use of anti-PD-1 inhibitors. So I don't mind talking about that. So anti-PD-1 has been most widely used in adult cancers in things like melanoma and adult lung cancer. Um, and in children's cancers, generally using it on its own, it, we haven't seen responses because these the tumours that children get are not generally as um, visible to the immune system as, as tumours such as melanoma. 
So all the studies that have been done in children that have shown any promise have been combination studies, um, such as in minivan, where we're looking at using it to enhance um, the efficacy of a kind of a known immunotherapy, such as anti-GD2. Anti so I don't know of, of any other study. It's been incorporated. PD-1 is incorporating some CAR T cells as part of the CAR T cell um, construct. But I don't know any other studies that are, are combining it with um, other immunotherapies, Aras and Susan, I'm not sure whether you know of any others. And then an, um, another group, uh, a couple of questions are uh, touching on a really important point, which is how different are treatments for rel relapsed versus refractory disease? I think it would be useful if, if we could provide, a, a, all of us provide a, a, a response, because it, it, it is something that was you know, not not raised, um, I don't know, five or 10 years ago, but really now we are treating them differently. Well, I, I can start. I mean, I think the vast majority of our studies for patients who do not respond as we hope to upfront therapy, so whether they have refractory disease and or relapse disease, most studies that we use, both those groups are eligible for. And um, for example, the, the study that was uh, shown a couple times this morning, looking at the combination of chemotherapy plus antibody, um, that study through the COG was open to both patients with refractory and relapsed disease. What I think is very important uh, is that the outcome and the responses and the survival really need to be looked at separately because it's coming more, much, much more clear that that can be very different as to whether you have refractory disease or if you have relapse disease. And it also is quite clear um, if your refractory disease is a solid tumor mass versus metastatic disease to the bone or the bone marrow. So I think as we are starting for the very first time, for, frankly, in the last couple of years, to really see some beautiful responses and even some long-term remissions in our patients who have refractory disease and relapse disease, I think there'll have to be some additional analysis when we take a look at uh, who responds, how they respond, and, um, and, and how their outcomes differ based on these different categories. And lumping them all together is probably not the best way to do it because I suspect there are certain things as we start to separate them out that we'll see some heterogeneity and we may see some treatments that work better in one subset than another. And I'd echo Dr. Cohn's uh, comment. Uh, in addition, I'd just say, I think one of the real challenges in uh, this refractory disease is making sure that we're all using similar definitions because there's a, a, a broad range of definitions and some patients who have what's called uh, refractory disease may actually uh, be considered uh, non-refractory in, in another study. And so uh, that uh, definition and being strict about really selecting the patients who are truly what we all can agree upon are refractory is uh, very important. Right. And to, and to also, I mean, uh, Araz has published about this as well. I mean, also to complicate matters further, I think when you have a big bulky tumor at your primary site, very, very difficult to know exactly how active that tumor is, how much tumor is in that tumor, whether it's differentiated, whether it's largest, you know, product. So, and, and the measurement may not change very much, and you may say it's a refractory, large, soft tissue mass, um, but very much depends on what the biology of that residual tumor is. So that makes it even more. Complicated. So the, the other, the other complicating factor is that the as treatment upfront treatment changes, that the treatment children will have had at relapse. Is going before, at the point of relapse will be different. So many children now who relapse will have had um, chemo immunotherapy during induction and during maintenance, and their responses at relapse may be different to those who haven't had those treatments prior. So it may be difficult to apply. Um, um, we will need to apply the results of studies to kind of with that in mind when we, we look at whether they still apply to the population. Exactly. And, and of course, the other thing that's always been pointed out is the tumor does change over time because of all the treatment. And sometimes yeah. there's mutations, there can be new other molecular changes. And so I think that there's been a big push to try to re-biopsy tumors so that we can uh, reevaluate the genomic uh, makeup of the tumors at the time of relapse. And there may be opportunities to use some targeted therapies 
at relapse, whereas that particular mutation wasn't diagnosed or seen or identified at, at diagnosis. Super, great. <clears throat> there's, there's one specific question on why some patients undergo uh, stem cell collection, a peripheral blood stem cell collections, whereas others have a bone marrow stem cell collection and why, how is that chosen? And it's a, a question particularly in the, for the patients in the UK. I don't know if that's a uh, general practice. I'd say it's very, it's very unusual now to do a bone marrow collection of stem cells, and we would only really do that as a last resort if we can't harvest peripheral blood stem cells because it's usually um, easy, successful to do that with GCSF um, beforehand. And it, um, the, the um, bone marrow recovery is quicker after peripheral blood stem cell um, transfusion rather than bone marrows. Um, but it, occasionally we won't be able to harvest them and it'll be done, but it's it's not very often that we would do that. Great, um, thank you. And there, there's um, another group of questions on the role of um, transplant or autologous stem cell transplant at the time of relapse. So one question is, if you haven't got it at the uh, at front line, is it worth getting it at, uh, at the time of relapse? And the other one is the opposite. If you have had it, um, they have been offered as an option to have a second autologous stem cell transplant. So it'd be great to, to hear uh, people's thoughts, it, particularly in, in light of the of the changes with uh, with tandem transplant uh, uh, also. So I guess it would depend why you hadn't had a transplant the first time round. Uh, um, and normally there would be a good reason for not having a transplant. You know, most children will get a transplant in. Um, as part of frontline treatment, and if, if it's not given, then um, that reason may still be relevant. Um, but I guess then it depends at what time point child relapses, and occasionally we might think about a second transplant if it's been a very late relapse and the child is well, and it may be um, it's felt that they would tolerate it, tolerate a second procedure. Yeah, and I think that there's a lot of um, discussion, you know, particularly if you did not respond to your induction chemotherapy and you've got a lot of refractory disease, um, you know, it, that really suggests that this tumor is not particularly sensitive to chemotherapy or cytotoxic agents. And I know there's a lot of debate what to do with those patients, and many of those patients do not move on to transplant if there's a lot of bone marrow disease and a lot of bone disease. Um, and they're treated with alternative treatments, albeit you know some kind of immunotherapy regimen with chemotherapy or MIBG or both. And and then I think the big question comes up though is if patients then respond to the uh, subsequent therapy and never never had a transplant, and they respond, are those patients good? Um, uh, good subjects to consider getting good patients to consider getting a transplant at that stage of the game. And there's a lot of debate um, because transplant is really higher doses of chemotherapy. And I know that there's um, folks that absolutely would, if someone had a nice response to the subsequent therapy, would certainly suggest the patients move on to get the transplant. Others feel that having not responded to the induction chemotherapy is a sign that that particular tumor perhaps wouldn't respond particularly well to even higher doses of chemotherapy. It hasn't been, uh, that's being used for transplant. And so it's a, it's a question that's out there. I think it's a question that has to be looked at carefully. We all are aware that, um, you know, consolidation and as, as, as Raz has mentioned, we use tandem consolidation regimens now in, the, in North America, you know, it, it does have risk associated with it. And so it's a very, it's a very difficult question and we do not have the answer yet. Um, as to whether or not those patients should then go on to get a transplant if they never got one up front. And, and I would add that the, the, the German group is the group that has worked more in, a sec in, in collecting some data for patients getting a second autologous transplant at the time of relapse with, with not great, um, the, the results were not outstanding. And then after that, they moved to use the, a haploidentic transplant, which is an approach that is common practice in Germany, but it's not so in the rest of Europe or in, or in North America. They published the, the results. The results they seem encouraging, but it is difficult to compare them and see if what 
the, what the rest of the world is doing is, is better or worse. And we have had numerous discussions in, in COPEN on how to, to take this information and how to, to really see if this if there is um, an effect of a haploidentic transplant. A haploidentic transplant is a, a is a is a transplant from a donor being one of your parents. Um, so uh, the, the the question is still still out. Um, and but it's just relatively common to common practice in, in Germany, but not in the in the rest of the world. Yeah, and I think one of the complications of that particular study is that they also added immunotherapy. And it's very difficult to know if the results that they saw, how much of it was related to the um, allo transplant versus the immunotherapy that was added to that regimen. Lots of questions about that as well. Lots of unknowns. Yes, um, there's there's one very good question that um, I think we, we we expected it to to come up, um, and that is related relating to the management of CNS uh, relapses. Um, so I don't know if, if particularly um, Aras or, or or Sue, you have any uh, updates on, on on CNS relapses and the, the option. I'll let Aras go ahead. Uh, so uh, there was initially a trial uh, uh, that got initiated at MSK that used uh, Omvortimab, uh, which is a radio label, 8H9, um, that uh, uh, was uh, quite uh, uh, interesting initially and had uh, another trial that uh, 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 was outside of MSK. However, um, uh, it was a, a single arm trial, and that trial um, um, uh, has uh, gone uh, and been reviewed at the FDA, and uh, as opposed to what Dr. Cohn said earlier about the advisory committee uh, for the FMO, on that advisory committee, um, the decision uh, or the recommendation was not to go forward with approval. Uh, so that agent uh, uh, is uh, currently uh, uh, being evaluated uh, to. Um, in terms of next steps. Uh, however, uh, generally uh, beyond uh, that, um, I think um, uh, for our many would agree that our standard has been resection, radiation, chemo chemotherapy, um, and uh, I, uh, that uh, having, uh, although not uh, great uh, outcomes, uh, has been successful in some patients and so the role of immunotherapy on top of that is uh, unknown at this point. Right, and the other thing I think it's important to keep in mind is it very much depends if you have an isolated, completely resected CNS lesion. Um, there certainly is uh, some better prognosis that's associated with somebody who has an isolated CNS lesion that can be completely resected. And then typically um, cranial spinal radiation is, is used on top of um, chemotherapy as well as sometimes immunotherapy is used systemically. So uh, there's multi-modality uh, multi treatments that are used uh, to treat patients, uh, but those are the patients that seem to have the best prognosis is if indeed you can completely resect the, um, the, the mass the, or, or masses, but it can be completely resected in the CNS. Great. There, there's one question um, that says, what are your thoughts of using inhibitor for maintenance therapy? So we would ask that that person to, to be a bit more specific because I think inhibitor can be, I don't know if they mean a specific, an ALK inhibitor, a specific inhibitor, or any kind of targeted therapies just, just to 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 be able to respond that question properly and then i think from from now on i can hand over back to to alan and i'm hoping that we that we run smoothly from from now thank you sorry for my brief uh, introduce there of technical issues and um, so uh, i trust you're all in good hands with uh, lucas asking the questions and uh, the next question here is and it's a general question but it's an appropriate one why isn't more emphasis and research put into first line uh, treatment in order to prevent relapse and refractory Well, I would argue that that's what we've been doing a lot of, you know, every single study we've done that I showed you in that whole history of um, high risk treatment, you know, we, we changed induction, we changed consolidation, we added post consolidation therapy with immunotherapy. And so, of course, everybody wants to do better upfront. And you saw from the curves that both Dr. Marcellian and I showed 
we were able to show an improvement in event-free survival, meaning a decrease in relapses over the decades with the treatments that we have been um, we've been conducting uh, both across both both places, both in Saipan as well as in the United States and North America. Um, and then what we showed you was that of the patients who do go on and 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 not respond the way we want, because it, it is we're, we're at sixty percent, we're not at one hundred percent. So there are unfortunately patients who are not doing what we want them to do with their upfront therapy. You know, we're now you know we've got different types of, of relapse therapy that we're considering and different types of therapy for refractory disease. But we're also conducting additional trials for upfront treatment where we're adding in new agents, you know, um, and we're testing, for example, uh, in 1531, whether the addition of MIBG will improve um, event-free survival further, whether the addition of lorlatinib will improve event-free survival further in upfront patients who have um, an ALK mutation. So that is a that is our primary goal is to improve the upfront therapy so that nobody relapses and we don't have to deal with uh, relapse therapy. And I would add to say that the reality is neuroblastoma is still a rare disease, and so we have to be really careful with what question we ask because each one of the questions we ask in our upfront therapy are going to be uh, lasting. Uh, uh, some years, five years, et cetera. So we really have to be careful uh, and uh, study things um, and uh, choose the best ones that we can go forward with. And so that's why you can see that there are less upfront treatments and more relapse treatments because you have to first learn to decide which one's the one you take forward. Right. And I think. I was just going to say, I think a perfect example is what Lucas said, where we now have this really nice data on the setting of relapse and refractory disease that the combination of immunotherapy and uh, chemotherapy has really led to beautiful responses in that setting. And that is now going to be tested up front because you have a, a, a treatment that's active in relapse. And so we're going to move it up front um, and we're going to see if we move it up front, that'll lead to improved event-free survival and a decrease in relapse. Thank you. I, I think just from my point of view, uh, there was a nice comment during uh, Juliet's uh, presentation, which was said that understanding what improves has fundamentally changed the practice across the world. So when you are looking to improve frontline uh, treatments, it's great to see that that uh, information is being shared so that we sort of try and reduce the amount of patients that end up with relapse. So I think that's a very positive thing. Um, Moving on to the next audience question, um, and hopefully you haven't covered this one, but uh, could someone explain the difference between blood stem cells, which I pre presume means peripheral uh, stem cells, and bone marrow stem cells? And why is bone marrow uh, transplant used in the UK? And maybe there's a terminology issue here, but maybe someone could address that in the first place. I think that's probably a terminology issue. Um, certainly in the in the UK, we would usually use peripheral blood stem cells, um, and um, only as a last resort use stem cells uh, taken from the bone marrow itself um, if we can't get peripheral blood stem cells. So I think that's probably just people using the terminology um, differently. Yeah, I, I suspect so. Uh, the last question. So thanks for that, Dr. Gray. The last question we have um, is, um, no, we've covered DFMO in my absence, so thank you for that. The clarifying question from question 14, which was um, around your thoughts of using inhibitors, the clarification was it was an inhibitor for an FGF4 mutation. Does that help, Dr. Moreno, to explain that? Yes, <clears throat> yeah. So, um... We, we see that the small groups of patients with neuroblastoma have mutations that are shared with other pediatric cancers and, it, and indeed with other adult cancers. So it's, it's I think it's below 5%, the, the proportion of patients with, the, uh, with neuroblastoma that have got an, an FGR, uh, FGFR uh, mutation. And there are FGFR inhibitors available. Um, the data on, on pediatric patients is still 
um, relatively limited. Um, and these, uh, these subpopulations are so infrequent that we will not be able to have a, a neuroblastoma trial as we did without, for example. Um, so it will have to be pooling all the patients um, with all the pediatric cancers that receive FGFR inhibitors that, that we can see the, the results. So it is um, most likely not uh, something that would guide frontline treatment um, and it even not would, would guide the treatment for fresh relapse, but it is an option um, to participate in trials of FGFR inhibitors um, in, if, if other treatments haven't worked. Um, so it, it is um, it is a, a good option to try to, to pursue targeting um, FGFR, but still we don't have the results. Um, some of these inhibitors work really well and we have seen in other pediatric cancers with BRAF inhibitors or with um, NTRAC inhibitors, um, and they do as they do work really well in adult cancers, different types of adult cancers, and in pediatric cancers as far as they share the same genomic aberration. But that doesn't happen in in every aberration. There's also an element that each tumor type has a different environment and a different genomic aberration. Um, so it, there, there's still no no um, clear answer of of yes, an FGFR uh, inhibitor should be given. But if, if it is a, uh, an option within a trial, it's really reasonable. Thank you. Um, one probably second to final question as we were in for our last 10 minutes of an exciting or very interesting uh, seminar. So um, outside on um, is there published research on patient outcomes using other three treatments for CNS relapse disease? And if not, what can the community do to improve the data on the experience of CNS relapse patients? Yeah, I mean, I, I think following up on on, uh, on Professor Cohn's comment uh, before, um, the the. There is more data being being collected. There is a COPEN study that studied all the COPEN CNS relapses, and none of them treated with uh, with umbertumab. Uh, but I, I think the second part of the question of what can we do to improve the experience of of CNS relapse patients, it is important because we are collecting data on on all on all relapses on the clinical trials. We are doing efforts to pull the data from the different clinical trials into the INRG so that all the trials in relapse patients in, in, from different parts of the world end up also being being shared. Um, but the, there is a need to, to enhance the, the data collected for, for um, CNS patients. I, I do think there's um, work that is going on looking at uh, CAR T cells in CNS disease. CAR T cells has been, um, there have been a couple studies uh, showing that it has uh, quite significant effects in some of the brain tumors. And I know there's a several groups that are now trying to see if we can use CAR T cells for patients who have CNS disease as well. So certainly it's an area that everyone understands is in dire need of a different additional treatment. And um, there are a number of groups that are, are looking at various types of approaches. It's just um, the antibody that was used in the Sloan Kettering study is, is, is not gonna be available. And this, uh, the difficulty there generally is exactly the issue of uh, we have resection, radiation, and then uh, the trials that we might need to consider are trials that have, uh, that start off with a patient with no disease, uh, and you're looking at the, uh, then the outcome, and that, uh, uh, those trials have some challenges because you can't really show response. And so uh, that has been a challenge uh, with small numbers and uh, trying. So I think some of this work uh, with uh, 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 CAR T cells, et cetera, may be uh, the way to go with uh, uh, more disease uh, in a different setting, in a further setting. Great, thank you. As we approach our last five minutes, I, I have one question, um, which is, in, in the scenario of re relapse and refactoring your blastoma, time is of the essence for us as parents. And one of the things we need to establish um, very quickly, what's available and what's relevant. And I was excited to see what Dr. Moreno presented in his talk about simple strategies to color code, explain what's available and is it relevant. Um, does the panel think there is a need to improve that type of availability and accessibility of information 
And are they aware of any strategies ongoing multinationally or pan-nationally to help with that? I can bring up one thing. Uh, my colleague, uh, Sam Volchenbaum at the University of Chicago is setting up something that's called a gearbox. He's done this for some of the other leukemias, AML. And they're now trying to build this uh, database, which will include any trial that's on clinicaltrials.gov and all of the eligibility criteria so that uh, families will be able to put in some information about their child's condition and some of the genetics, if there's an amputation or endemic amplification or whatever, whatever it is. And it's a database that then will provide a list of, of clinical trials that have been um, posted on clinicaltrials.gov at the, the NIH uh, website, which includes trials from Europe as well. So it's all over the world. It's not just North American trials. And it also will list out for you when this gets built. It's in the process. Uh, number one, the name of the trial. Number two, uh, it'll, as I said, outline the eligibility. But it'll also provide information about where that trial is open in terms of at what institution, what countries, those types of things. So that's all being built at the current time. Um, and Dr. Vultramans received some grant funding to, to do that. And um, I think that that might end up helping, you know, substantially, because I agree a little bit depends on where you go and what institution you go to and what your particular physician knows about or doesn't know about in terms of the trials that are offered. Um, and then this way, they, it puts the power in the patient's hands, right, to decide what trial looks like it might be something that would uh, be appropriate for their child. And then you can also know, does it mean you have to travel or is there something down the street, you know, in terms of a, a trial that would be available? Sounds, sounds like a fantastic initiative. Yeah, that's, that's really, um, kind of really, really important. And we, I mean, we're, we're working both in ITCC and, and CFN in, in the European side. We're working with the advocacy committees um, that with the advocates that, we, that are part of the, part of the network to facilitate these, these links. We're trying to, to build that into the website and, and and make it a bit more automatic but it, it takes um quite some time so yeah that's something where we all have to to work together so that everyone is aware of the options and of the of the level of priority that, that the options should have thank you thank you so with that we're down for our last two minutes so it's it's um just take this opportunity to thank everybody for their presentation the honest and open conversation um, and the answering the questions. Um, the ne we've reached the end of this session, however, there is more happening. So remember, if you miss this session and want to catch up on it, it, is, it will be available on demand right on the event platform. Um, after the, uh, up next, after the break at um, 16.05 GMT, we have two sessions. On the research track, we're going to have a discussion on advocacy and research right here on stream one. And on the support of care track, we're going to look at the impact of chemotherapy, chemotherapy on hearing, which you can head over to stream two for in the left-hand menu. So with that, thank you all for your attention. Thank you for your presentations and enjoy the rest of the conference. And I wish you all the best luck on your journey here. Best luck.